I'm Jeremy, and today I'm going to take a look at a game by the name of Fairy Tile. This is co-designed by Matthew Dunstan and Brett J. Gilbert, published by Yellow. I believe it's a 2018 game. The game plays from uh, two to four players for ages eight and up in about 30 minutes, which seems accurate. Um, and it is a tile-laying game where players are going to be racing to get through a stack of objective cards. Um, uh, it takes place in a, a fairy tale kingdom, as the tile, title implies. Players are going to be manipulating on the tiles that they lay out a series of figures. There's a knight, a dragon, and a princess, trying to line them up so in a way that will enable them to complete their objective cards. First player to get through all of their objective cards is going to be the winner. Let me take a minute to show you how it works, and I'll come back and let you know what I think about the game. So at the start of the game of Fairy Tile, you'll set up these uh, three starter tiles with these white marks in, next to each other in the center. You'll put each figure on their corresponding icon, so we have a dragon, a princess, and a knight. You'll create a stack of extra tiles to add to the kingdom. Each player is going to get... Uh, you'll divide up these story cards among all the players. There's 36 of those, so you'll get uh, basically 12, 18, or 9, depending on two, three, or four players. Each player is going to get one of these magic markers, these one markers, which will start face down. And each player could get a player aid, which just explains the turn structure and the movement. Um, so the objective is to be the first person to get through their stack of cards. So at the start of the game, each player is going to draw the top card, which will give them an objective. Essentially, this is what really matters here. There's going to be some uh, text here that tells you what needs to happen. So here, the princess and dragon meet in the mountains. So to clear this card, this player will need to manipulate these figures so that the, both the princess and the dragon are going to be on a mountain space together um, at the end of the turn where this player has moved them. Um, you know, and this player, their objective is the knight can see three lined up planes. So you can see that the, there are these planes markers here, or planes tokens here. Uh, three of those will need to be lined up, which obviously is not possible at the start of the game here. So on your turn, your options are essentially two two things. The first thing is to turn a page. So this player would not be able to complete this objective. And it will probably be some time uh, before three planes are going to be lined up on the board, especially because the next available tile doesn't even have a plane on it. So for your turn, what you could do is you could just basically, it's called turning your page, which basically you put your card on the bottom and you take a new card. Um, so you'll still have to complete that one, but you're delaying it. For doing that, you'll also get to flip over this magic marker to the... Uh, uh, active side. So this player will get this token which will allow them when they move characters to do a double move of characters before they try to complete a objective. So now the um, objective here is that the dragon moves over a castle which is still not especially easy to do. So that that's the first option. You could just turn the page um, and then you can uh, flip your marker if it's not already flipped. Second option is, and again this player is trying to make the princess and the dragon meet in the mountain, is that you can um, add a tile. So when you add a tile, you just take the top tile and you can place it anywhere to extend the kingdom. So the rules for extending the kingdom are basically that um, if you're adding a, a, a tile, it has to touch on at least two sides. So you couldn't do something like that because it's only touching on one side. You have to do something more like this. And if you're adding next adjacent to a river space, so for example here, you would have to make it so that the river lines up. If it can't be added, like here the river does not connect to here, this could not be added here legally, um, even, although it could be added that way legally because it extends the river. Um, al although you could have multiple rivers, so the player could, for example, just add this one here. So that would be their entire turn. They would be able to check if they had completed any of their cards. So the, the various cards have a few different terminologies on them, which are laid out on the uh, card here at the bottom, but you should definitely explain those to players at the start of the game. So the, you can see the options there are see, visit, and meet. See just means basically that uh, they have line of sight to the characters. So right now, uh, the princess here, uh, she can't see the knight because there's not a straight line from her to the knight. But if she was here, she'd be able to see the dragon because you could draw a line here. Even if you know the knight was here, she would still be able to see the dragon. Other characters don't block line of sight. And here, for example, she'd be able to see the knight. You could see people who are in the same space. But you know, here, she could both see 
the dragon and see the knight. So it's as long as there's a straight line between them and the character they're trying to see, or if they're on the same space, they that counts as seeing. Second thing is visit. So basically you have to end your movement and then you have to visit the locations that, that's depicted. So you specifically have to move the character. So for example, if we had the dragon visited a mountain, the dragon would have to, for example, go here. And then at the end of the turn, they would have visited a mountain. Um, and then the uh, last thing is meet, which is end your movement on the same location space as another character. So just basically have more than one figure on the same space um, and they will have be considered to have met the other character. So those are how, so basically the princess and the dragon meet in the mountains would mean that on my turn I have to move one of the characters so that both the princess and the dragon are on the same mountain space. The trick is that the movements for these characters are very restricted and they're each different. So the first is the knight. So the knight's requirement is that he has to move two spaces away from the space that he's on. So if he was here, he would have to go, for example, one, two, or one, two, or one, two, you know, anything like that. But he can't, for example, go one, two and back where he's at. And he also just, actually, he wouldn't be able to go one, two. He has to go two spaces away from uh, where he's at. So two spaces away from where he's at. This would just be one space away. So always has to go two spaces away. Um, the next is the uh, princess. The princess could move one space, but she has the special ability to uh, teleport from castle to castle. So at the start of the game, there's just one castle there, but, um, at the, uh, you know, as the tiles get added out, there'll be extra ca castles added. So let's, for example, just say later in the game, there was this castle here, right? Um, the princess could, if she begins on a castle, teleport to another castle if she wants, and then move one space. Or, it, let's say she was here at the start of her turn, she can move one space onto a castle, then teleport to another castle. So that's how the princess moves. The dragon, the way the dragon moves, is they could move, they have to move any number of spaces to the end of a line. So he basically flies to the end of a line. So for example, if he was going to move this direction, he has to go all the way to the end until he hits the edge of the play field, or from here to here. Or if he was here, he could go here, for example. Once he was here, he'd be able to go here, to here, to here, or to here. So essentially, he has to all, or to here. He always has to go all the way. He can't stop, you know, at this space. He, ha he would have to just keep going. So those are the restrictions for the uh, movements of the, the three characters. So you can see it could become somewhat tricky. It's a bit of a puzzle to try to get them to line up at the same space. So, um, you know, as, as you're playing, you're going to be able to manipulate those characters. Again, if you have this face up, you'll get to move two characters, which could be really helpful in trying to line them up so that they'll meet a requirement. Um, and then um, um, as soon as you complete a card, so let's say the, the dragon was here and it was this player's turn. They have the dragon moves over a castle as an objective. So for their turn, they could choose to move the dragon in a straight line to here. It would move as it was moving over the castle. That would allow them then to complete that card. It would just go out of the game. They would take their next card. And then now they would have to do this. The, the knight can see the dragon and the princess. So here you can see he cannot see either of them. But if he had moved, you know, for example, one, two, he would be able to then see both figures on a future turn. So essentially, you're going to be trying to complete these objectives as they come out. First player to get through their deck immediately will be the winner. All right, so that is Fairy Tile. And I should preface this by saying that um, this game definitely appealed to me from the outside. Um, I generally like tile laying games. It's one of my preferred genres. And I like uh, family weight games. This is a 30 minute game for you know, ages 8 and up. That's usually something that I'll enjoy. And uh, it seemed like a very uh, clever game from the outset. Um, the idea of you know, laying down tiles to complete secret objectives um, seemed appealing. In practice, I have to say that this is uh, probably one of my least favorite games I've played in recent times. Um, I find that uh, it has some very questionable design decisions in it that just make it not at all enjoyable to me. Uh, first of all, um, I think that with, a, with two players, this would quickly become a zero-sum game. Because uh, you're generally only able to move one piece on your turn, um, and you're trying to complete an objective which you don't know what the other player's objectives are. If you had two players, uh, it's very, uh, you know, very obvious that 
this could quickly devolve into a tug of war where you move a character one way on the next player's turn will move a character the other way and it just keeps going back and forth and I'm, I'm not there is a way you know to get two moves from a character um, be, you know before your turn but still doesn't really you know resolve that issue where this could become a, a stalemate where characters are just playing tug of war for, with the same piece back and forth um, and oftentimes, to complete these objectives, because of the very idiosyncratic ways that the uh, figures move, it will take more than two moves to set up uh, the combination that you have. Uh, so this is, you know, the game does give you an ability to toss a card out to get a new card, a new objective, uh, if, you know, something's going to take too many moves at the time that you're trying to complete it. But near the end of the game, where you might only have, you know, say two objectives or even one objective left, uh, you're going to be in positions where you essentially cannot, um, in two moves, uh, complete your objective, and you know that. You know, so all you could do is move a piece and hope that nobody else messes with it. In a two-player game, again, that could just become a back-and-forth tug-of-war situation until players take a turn out to flip their tile, which just gets them an extra move and then you know, repeats the process. Uh, in a four-player game, people are going to be messing with what you're trying to plan out uh, without you being able to intercede. So there'll be three more turns before you get your next chance to move those figures to potentially line them up. So I think that for a family game, it becomes a very frustrating ex experience where people are messing with you without even realizing it. Or it, worse yet, if they figure out that the, you know, what you're trying to do, they could just mess with you um, to you know, set you back several turns because the way that the figures move, for example, especially that dragon, if you just entirely move it out of a thing, it could take you know, for example, four or five moves to get back to where that dragon was. So it could be very, very frustrating. I could imagine children having a really bad time with this. I didn't play with children yet. Uh, I don't intend to because I just see that as a pitfall. The other thing is those objectives are extremely uneven. Um, you know, there are some objectives that just require two characters to meet on the same time, which could be easy if one of them is not the dragon. But if it's the dragon and, like, you know, the only eligible tiles are in the center of, a sp of the uh, grid, it could be almost impossible for the dragon to manipulate itself, since it has to stop at the end of the tiles, to a position where it could complete that objective. Indeed, it does say in the rules that there are, are, are no-win scenarios that could crop up where you might have an objective that you simply can't complete. And if all players are stuck with that because of the way that the tiles came out, all players could all actually lose. So that does not seem like a satisfying outcome for anybody, frankly. It should ha probably have a rule in there that at least the player with the most incomplete cards wins or something, but it doesn't. It just says all players lose, which is not very good. Um, especially, And that's just exacerbated to an extreme because at the start of the game, you are giving a stack of cards, so up to 12 cards. You have no idea what's in that stack. You have no ability to, t to know... Uh, whether you're going to have the card, for example, that requires you to be on a large river, which is essentially five interconnected river tiles. Based on how those tiles are going to be placed over the course of the game, a large river may or may not ever be formed. You know, do not know whether or not you are going to specifically need a large river or if that card is in some other player's pile at the start of the game. You have no ability to gauge whether or not you are going to need um, a large forest, which is three or more forest tiles connected, or have th there's a card in there that requires you know three um, planes tiles that are in a direct line of one another, and the character has to be able to see that. So the character would need to you know you would need to have on the board three planes tiles lined up, but other players aren't going to know. Uh, and you're not going to know if you have that objective. They're not going to know if they have that objective. So players aren't going to be able to build with any sort of foresight. The idea that you know, you, you know that that card is in somebody's pile is a factor, I suppose. Somebody's going to need three planes lined up in a, in a row. But it's very possible that those tiles are going to get laid out so that configuration doesn't exist. And you don't know which player is going to get, you know, essentially lose the game because that doesn't ever get built. So, of course, you know, you could say, well, everybody should just build it just in case they have that card. But it just seems like a very tricky thing. Like, especially on a first play, you have no idea what the possible objectives are going to even be. So you could easily build without knowing that uh, those are potentialities. So um, just the fact that there are these no-win conditions that you can't really prepare for, um, you don't know... Uh, 
whether or not what your specific objectives are going to be is baffling to me. It just seems like a terrible design decision. And then also just the way that the characters move, your limited ability to control any given character on a certain turn makes setting up some of those objectives extremely hard, whereas somebody else might just get ones that they could pop through every single turn and easily line up. It's just extremely swingy, extremely luck dependent, um, to the point that I think it just undermines this, the sense of planning. It's, a, a, it's an entirely tactical game, but you have very little control over what situations are going to arise for you at the start of the game based on what cards you're randomly dealt. Somebody could get 12 easy objectives, somebody could get you know 12 uh, hard objectives, and that is basically going to seal their fate at the start of the game. So it's a game that um, looks great, seems like it has a lot of terrific me mechanisms in it. Um, I like the idea of, you know, laying out tiles to complete objectives um, that are specific to you. Some good tile laying games have that, like Isle of Sky, for example, has that. And I generally do like these tile laying games, and I do like that this does not, this never becomes mathy in the sense that, it, I guess geometrically it is, but there's not scoring. Uh, direct scoring, it's just who's the first person to get through their deck. That, seem, that, that appeals to me. It's, it seems sensible for a family game. But at the same time, it's just uh, the amount of planning that could happen, the amount of in, unintentional screwage that you could do to other players, or even intentional screwage, and then just the sheer randomness of that card deck that you have, and the um, randomness of the tiled, tiles being laid out with you having no potentially no ability to um, foresee the requirements that you're going to need to meet um, and make sure that those are even potential versus the map tiles that you have, which there aren't that many. There's uh, three starter ones, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, maybe 12 additional tiles get added. Um, and, you know, to create a river that's five long, um, three um, plains in a row, three mountains in a row, three... Um, forest in a row and so on, to be able to do that uh, takes definite planning and intention on the parts of the players. But again, there's no sense that you know that you're going to need those things unless you see that card. So unless you really spend a lot of turns going through your deck at the start of the game, which is very wasteful, to see what you have before you start laying tiles and assume that no other players are laying tiles at, at the same time, I, I have no idea how, how uh, the game is designed to let you you know, know whether or not you're creating a sudden death or a, or a no-win scenario, rather, for yourself by laying out tiles. Um, so it's, to me, a very disappointing game. Maybe that there are people who will like it and, uh, you know, don't mind the high level of randomness uh, just because, you know, the components are terrific, the, the theme is cute. Uh, but for me, it's a total pass. Uh, not a game that I enjoy, not a game that I could recommend. Uh, that is Fairy Tile.